So, congratulations, first of all. Thank you. You must be incredibly proud, but uh, to, you know, a few opening remarks, perhaps, from you on your, your view of uh, the, obviously the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games, albeit with a few days still to go. Yes, absolutely, albeit with a few days to go. And uh, we've still got another four full days to, to go, and therefore, uh, as with any sporting event, I guess, when you're in the last 20 minutes, you can't afford to take your, your eye off the ball. Uh, but so far, I mean, we've been fantastically fortunate with the weather, which we were worried about, of course, back earlier on in the summer. Um, reference has just been made to transport, and of course that has worked, I think, as well as we, as we could have, uh, as, well, as well as we could have hoped. The park itself, I think, has worked um, particularly well. Um, and uh, for me, I mean, it's just been a pleasure going into the park and seeing, in a sense, just how relaxed and uh, people are and how clearly they've been enjoying it. And uh, to see full stadiums, and particularly to see the full stadiums this last week during the Paralympics. And uh, for me, it's on occasions, I mean, there was a situation some of you may have seen two nights ago when uh, the last athlete in the 5,000 meters was two laps behind the guy who won. And uh, this chap just kept going. And the spectators gave him as big a reception and applause for those last two laps as you saw uh, David Weir get uh, last night. And I think you know, the, the athletes would say they've just never experienced anything like this uh, before, particularly the Paralympians. And I think it's the, the Paralympics particularly which um, has really just blown people away in terms of how, how much they've enjoyed it and how successful it's mm -hmm. been. Indeed. Um, when you took up your role um, at the ODA, I think transport was often cited as going to be one of your big challenges. Uh, how do you think the ODA, what role did the ODA play in, 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 in transport overall? And did you meet, and, uh, meet, meet those challenges? Yeah, so in transport and the, particularly the planning and thinking about the transport was an ODA responsibility under the, under the Act of Parliament. And, uh, and then we had to ensure that it could be delivered. Uh, we've had a team probably of 30 people um, for the last three or four years um, planning the transport, uh, looking at every aspect of it. The fundamental decision taken, this will be a public transport games. There will be no car parking essentially on the, on the Olympic Park. Uh, so we were clearly going to be relying largely on, um, on, the, uh, on the rail system and on coaches. And uh, that just required um, a great deal of detailed planning, getting an understanding, obviously, from the federations and from LOCOG as the sort of numbers that we could expect. And then sort of having to make lots of guesstimates. So, for example, how many people are going to be at the par in the park at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? You don't really know, because you don't know how many will have stayed on from the morning session. You don't know precisely what time the evening session people are coming. You've got the afternoon session there. So you run the risk of having three times the theoretical normal number for a session in the park at the same time. And how that impacts on transport, how that impacts even just on the, the if you like, the, the ped routes, the pedestrian routes within the park all become quite critical issues, which you, you have to estimate, but you can never be absolutely mm -hmm. sure about. We produced, I think it was three versions, Georgia, of the transport plan, which we published every year as, we were, as they became more and more detailed. And a particular aspect of that was accessibility uh, and dealing with and doing the best we could. It was never going to be perfect, but working with TFL and other organizations to say, right, what's the best we can do? How can we make the, the games as accessible as possible for people with, with disability? And that isn't something you can do overnight. It's something you've got to think about two years before, um, particularly if you're going to be changing the levels of platforms in stations, as has happened in, in, in some areas. Um, so uh, it was always a big risk for us. Um, and the, I guess the success is measured by the fact that the, the cars provided to the Olympic family, um, the drivers of those cars complained that during the Games they were not as busy as they had expected and hoped to be because the Olympic family realised that in fact to get from the centre of London out to Stratford it was quicker to go on the tube than it was to go in the Olympic lanes. And, uh, and the, the underground, as somebody just said, I mean it has worked, it has worked extremely well. I mean I think 
actually, if most Londoners are honest, they always knew they had a very good underground system. Many foreigners, particularly coming to London, um, visitors would say, gosh, you have got a fantastic uh, underground system. And it's been that which has been at the, the core of, um, of what we've done. Um, some people feel that an Olympic delivery authority's um, work ends as the Games time uh, begins. W what was the ODA up to during the Games and what will the ODA be doing post-Games? Yeah. During the Games, fundamentally, we've been doing the hard FM. So if Balfour Beatty built the Aquatic Centre, as they did, then um, Balfour Beatty's m and &E contractors team have been on the park all the time on uh, permanent... Uh, standby to deal with any issues um, around the, the fabric maintenance or uh, that's required of the facilities during, during the games. We also were left with the responsibility to run what was called the, uh, the park and ride. So we let a contract with um, National Express. Yeah. Uh, and National Express provided the coaches, but we actually ran the different uh, park and ride venues around, around London. Um, those have been our primary, our primary duties, park and ride and the hard FM. But we handed over security to LOGOG, we handed over our contract with G4S um, to LOGOG back in January, mm -hmm. sort of six months uh, before, the, before the games, and control of the park we handed across to, to LOGOG at, that, uh, at mm -hmm. that time. And post games, how the, it, does the ODA cease to exist, or does it morph into something else? No, the, the ODA has. We do a, a little bit of off-site uh, work. So, for example, where we've built everything down at uh, the uh, Royal Artillery Barracks for the shooting, we're responsible for taking those sort of um, things down. That we temporary venues that we built, the Locog temporary venues, Locog deal with on the park. Locog will strip out all their overlay. Um, the conversion of the park will go to the legacy company, and we gave 300 million pounds of what was originally in our budget across to the legacy company to handle that transformation work post games. Our primary role after the games, we own the village. We've, we've contracted with two organizations, so we've exchanged contracts with two organizations to sell the village, but the village um, mm -hmm. apartments don't have kitchens in. Um, we put temporary floor coverings down um, during the games, so we've got kitchens to install, um, new floors to put down um, in the in the village. So we've got about 15 months' work uh, to carry out in the in the village with contractors uh, and progressively complete the sale and hand over those individual apartments to the to the two buyers. Right. Now, for the last seven years, I've sat in pretty much every IOC session as. Uh, Lord Coe has delivered his um, progress report to the IOC, and one of the, the sound bites that he's used every single time, and I think every organizing committee has copied him since, is, we are on time and on budget. Is it just a, is it just a sound bite, or it, was it real? You know, how accurately can you say that you absolutely hit the budget that was laid out at the very beginning in the, in the bid book? Well, we certainly didn't hit the budget in the bid book. Right. <laughs> Uh, the bid book budget um, was incomplete. Um, it didn't include a lot of the infrastructure that was required. Um, it focused on the venues. Um, it didn't include uh, inflation, and it didn't include VAT. So having won the contract, Treasury then said, ah, well, yes, you will pay VAT. So that instantly added 17.5%. Um, inflation, of course, has been up and down according to the state of the economy. We benefited, really, from less inflation than we expected. Um, but in 2007, we reached an agreement with the government on what the budget would be, which was $8.1 billion for, for the ODA. And um, we undershot that at the end of the day by roughly a billion. And that billion went back and uh, in part obviously helped to pay for things like the extra security which came along late in the day. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> one of the, um, the things that, that you've probably gathered in the last hour from this particular uh, business summit is the intense interest from British companies, many of whom were involved with London 2012, but m many who weren't, um, in this whole uh, opportunity of getting involved in the sports major events project journey. Um, with your Compete For database, with uh, tens of thousands of companies on, many of them, most of them British, or well, many of them British, um, what, 
what is the situation now with that database? How does that move forward now? And, and, and what opportunity is there for British companies to step from that database into perhaps the export market for future events? The um, interesting thing about Compete For is that it's actually owned by the people who put roughly, if I remember rightly, about um, £100,000 each to setting it up, which was the UK regions. So the RDAs, who no longer exist, um, actually, with London, financed Compete For, and uh, they, they, in a sense, own it. Um, subsequently, TfL have been using it, um, and I believe Crossrail have been, have been using it for their procurement. It, but in the sense that it's publicly owned, one would hope that many other public bodies will continue to use um, Compete For as a database which they can continue to build on, of course, for UK procurement. Um, Springboard to Success was set up with, um, by UKTI um, last year, and uh, that, I think, roughly has got about 6,000 um, companies now registered on Springboard for Success. That was a database of companies who had been involved and were wanting to uh, sell their expertise. That originally was on hardback. It's now a web-based uh, database, which enables companies to put their, their, their um, uh, their capability on and learn about one another and obviously for, for anybody around the world basically to access and then of course the British Business Club has sought to do a, a follow-on to that so although the British Business Club is slightly wider in terms of what members of the British Business Club get from UKTI in terms of support so those sort of support mechanisms are are there for British companies but I mean you know, having spent a lot of time in international business myself, I mean, the only way you're going to win work is get on the aeroplane. Uh, absolutely. And that's exactly what our competitors are saying as well as we speak. Well, for now, uh, Sir John, thank you very much indeed. If you